Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Brave event, Thinking Outside the Lunchbox. I'm Karen Ashford and I'm delighted to host tonight's event as we explore the multiple facets that can influence attitudes to food and getting better nutrition onto kids' plates. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and highlight that their relationship to country remains strong and unbroken, even today. We pay our respects to Ghana elders, past, present and emerging, and also to those elders on whose country we deliver our learning and research. This evening's event is delivered as part of our BRAVE lecture series. Why BRAVE? Because through this series, we showcase our researchers who challenge the status quo and bravely investigate with a view to resolve some of the big societal challenges of our time. Tonight, we are fortunate to be hearing from Professor Rebecca Golly, a leading researcher in childhood obesity and nutrition promotion. Joining Rebecca for our panel discussion is nutritionist and managing director of Sprout Cooking School, Themis Cressidus. I'd like to remind the audience that if you're unable to join us for the duration of this live stream tonight, we are recording it for later viewing and you can view it on our website, flinders.edu.au. As always, we're keen to make this an interactive event with a live Q&A session, giving you the chance to participate in the discussion and to pose questions in real time. We do ask, however, that everyone treats this forum with respect and that you give credibility to people's different viewpoints. We're ready to start receiving questions now via the message function on this platform. So you can join the conversation on Twitter or use the hashtag Brave Research. And so now it's my pleasure to formally introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Rebecca Golly is a nationally recognised expert in childhood obesity and nutrition promotion. She's currently contributing to a national project involving a new free online toolkit called VegKit. She's also researching the potential for using digital platforms to better share nutritional information. Rebecca is, profession, is, sorry, is Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences here at Flinders University and is the Better Lives theme lead of the Caring Futures Institute. The Caring Futures Institute is Australia's first fully dedicated research organisation for the study of self-care and caring solutions. It spans health and wellness, care interventions and health, ageing and social care systems and services. It's my pleasure to invite Rebecca to begin our discussion this evening. Okay, thanks a lot, Karen, and hi, everyone um, out in the ether. So this evening I thought I'd start with a couple of statistics, and for many of you these won't be surprising, but for me these figures remain quite telling of the current reality. So by the time Australian children start school, only 6% of children are eating the recommended serves of vegetables. And for young children, this is two to four fistfuls, you know, child fistfuls of vegetables is what we'd be aiming for. By comparison, on average, 30% of children's daily energy intake comes from nutrient poor food and drinks, what we call discretionary choices. And there's some examples up on the slide. So, Think of items like cakes, biscuits, muesli bars, takeaway foods, ice cream, chocolates and lollies. Now, while these foods add to the enjoyment and culture of eating, they are recommended to be eaten in occasionally and in small amounts. And what small amounts means for Australian children under the age of eight is around half a serve a day. And we can equate that to three hot chips or one small biscuit, so not a lot. So these are two statistics that I'm passionate about influencing through the research program that I lead. Now we know that ve foods like vegetables have particular properties such as bitterness, which aren't innately appealing. On the other hand, these discretionary foods and drinks that are higher in energy, added sugars, saturated fat and salt, they're tasty, palatable, and easily overconsumed. 
However, if we could shift the balance between just these two groups, um, types of foods, this, there could be significant improvements both for the short and longer term health of Australian children and future generations. So the slide here shows some modelling and if we just didn't even meet the recommendation but just halve children's discretionary choices from where they are now and replaced it with foods like vegetables and fruit, in itself would moderate energy intake by 15%, sodium intake by 20% and added sugars by over 40%. So that's pretty big bag for buck um, to improve some of the nutrients associated with the significant chronic disease um, and other health concerns facing Australia as a population. So nutrition matters for children's health and development. So this single switch could influence lifetime risk of obesity and chronic diseases. And it would also make a meaningful difference to common concerns like dental caries in children. And we know that nearly a quarter of Australian children are already affected by overweight or ob obesity by the time they start school. And the most vulnerable children in our communities are at a higher risk of obesity. And we know that half of children with overweight in childhood will be overweight or obese in adult life. However, poor diet quality in childhood is a concern in of its own and matters for all Australian children, regardless of size or shape. Children's diet quality, and in particular their intake of discretionary choices, is associated, for example, with learning and educational outcomes. We found that higher intakes of foods like cakes, donuts, pizzas, hamburgers, soft drinks, is associated with lower NAPLAN school, um, scores for language, numeracy and reading. However, I think the reason I care so much about what children eat in childhood is it's the time where children learn to like liking to eat. It's when the food and habits are established that can last a lifetime. So a healthy diet is in, it's an important step to ensuring that Australian children have the best start to life and it matters for their health, growth, learning and development. As Karen mentioned, Flinders as part of a consortium with CSRO and Nutrition Australia is undertaking a large program of applied research called VegKit. VegKit is a nationwide effort to improve children's vegetable intake. And I encourage you to check out the website regularly as a collection of tools, resources um, that are relevant to educators, healthcare professionals, vegetable growers and broader food industry are rolled out. Through VegKit, we're developing infant feeding advice around how we can promote an enjoyment of vegetables right from when the first time that children um, are learning to eat in that sort of first taste of foods and in those early years. We're trialling new food service models in childcare and looking at developing vegetable-based products for school canteens. So this type of integrated approach that's aiming to promote an enjoyment of vegetables across multiple touch points represents the type of effort and investment needed to shift the statistics that I highlighted earlier. But perhaps without similar or perhaps even greater focus on discretionary choices, initiatives such as VegKit may not deliver their full potential. Without direct action to reduce children's exposure to unhealthy food and drinks, it is unlikely that children will have the appetite or space in their diets for the foods that really nourish. So, when are children, young children, eating discretionary choices and what are the top targets? Now you might think your mind might go straight away to takeaway foods such as McDonald's or soft drinks. These are common culprits and for some groups, particularly teenagers, soft drinks are consumed in large amounts, there's no doubt about that. And that's why the debate around public health levers such as bans on advertising, sponsorship and use of taxation are critical. 
But for young children, the top sources of just discretionary foods don't feature soft drinks. In an analysis of over 500 two-year-olds, discretionary choices contributed around a third of what toddlers ate and drank at lunch, dinner and between meals. Sweet and savoury items such as cakes, biscuits and muesli bars were common between meals. Fruit juice drinks, processed meats and biscuits at lunch, processed meats, hot chips and ice cream are common sources of these foods at the evening meal. And we've done similar analysis um, of the 2011-2012 National Nutrition Survey and we found similar results there. And once you start looking in the primary school age children, crisps and bakery goods like um, pies and pasties were also common. So I think by looking at the individual types of discretionary choices at different eating occasion, it highlights that there's no one silver bullet. There are multiple times of day when discretionary choices are eaten. And this is likely to reflect the range of factors influencing the foods provided to children. What's convenient, what has a long shelf life so you can eat it on the go, what are the social norms, how we view treats in our society, and the range of caregivers involved in feeding children mean that this is a very complex area of diet and a complex behaviour to change. So are there perhaps missed opportunities to turn these trends around? Despite decades of dietary advice in Australia, progress in shifting what Australian children eat to be more in line with our national recommendations has been slow. So between 1995 and 2007, we have achieved about one serve um, decrease in discretionary choices, so around two sweet biscuits or six hot chips, so very modest improvements. And over the similar period of time, that sort of static 5% of children meeting vegetable recommendations has held um, really as a plateau. So we have a clear sense of what dietary patterns support children's health, growth and development. However, how to foster a healthy diet in childhood and how to support the places and the people involved in providing food to children is less clear. So tonight I want to highlight a couple of opportunities that we have to perhaps reimagine how we support those who care for children. I want to look at how we can support parents and other caregivers around providing healthy meals, perhaps in the context of that evening meal. And also, is there an opportunity to rethink the lunchbox, to think about how we could do school food differently to support children's learning and development? So first of all, having a look at caregivers. So feeding children occurs in the context of multiple and often competing demands. And on the left of the um, screen, the cartoon by French cartoonist Emma speaks of what we call the mental load or the range of decisions and trade-offs, the mental lists, the juggling that parents and caregivers commonly voice. So amongst work demands, needing to look after yourself, maintaining relationships, school and extracurricular support, then there's the question of what's there to eat or what's for dinner, and then all of the work associated with planning, purchasing and preparing food. And it's been quantified that adults make over 200 decisions around food every day, and that's not counting the additional decisions that parents and caregivers make about what and when to feed children. So we really need to take a deep dive into the food choice decisions that are being made and the range of food coping strategies used. And that's where um, the ABC cartoon Bluey and Dad's attempt to secure a takeaway resonates in terms of a common food coping strategy that we know is associated with lower family diet quality. So notwithstanding the importance of needing to tackle the food supply and making sure we have a supportive food supply and also having a supportive policy context, what are some of the ways that we can re reimagine how parents and caregivers can be supported to get better nutrition onto children's plates? 
So I don't know whether others have, but I've been really enjoying Annabelle Crabbe's Back in Time for Dinner series on the ABC at the moment. And in this series, we see a modern family transported back in different decades um, of Australian history since Federation. And it provides a really great illustration of how the industrial and social fabric has changed and the impact that this has on the lives of men, women, children and families. Through this series, it's really obvious the changes that we've seen in the food supply as well as the role of women in society. And these are significant influences that still resonate and are influencing our food choices today. And the world in which we live continues to shape our everyday lives, including the food choices we make. And increasingly in current decades, we're seeing the role of technology in particular digital technology and the great p potential that it holds for a vehicle for health and nutrition promotion. And we've had a team of researchers that I've been working with and the lead there is um, a recent PhD student, Chelsea Morch, and she spent the last three and a half years looking at the role of mobile phone apps to support healthy family meals. She started by reviewing all of the apps in the App Store and in Google Play that intend to help with the planning, purchasing and preparation of meals. She then selected a small group of apps and those that held the most promise with aligning to the types of support that parents say they need. Through her research, she took five apps and got um, parents to test two of those to see if it made a difference in easing that burden or that mental load around um, healthy family meal provision. And the re results were telling. What Chelsea found was that parents did appeal, you know, the healthy recipes in these apps were engaging and inspiring and they also really loved the time saving or planning features such as planning meals ahead of time and something as simple as support to generate quickly a um, shopping list. However, parents identified a number of limitations which really prevented them utilising these apps to their full potential. And in particular, it was the amount of input that was needed to set up the apps was a really major barrier to parents utilising these apps. So if we draw, go away from nutrition and think about another behaviour in terms of transport, if we look at how digital technology has transformed the way we do transport, we've got Google Maps, Uber, even public transport timetables are now in, in the palm of our hand. And if we look at that behaviour, it's the value of the simplicity and the ability to use it in real time when you're wanting to, to move from A to B that make these sorts of technologies disruptive. You know, we don't use um, street directories anymore. It's transformed how we go about our business. So in that situation, we don't assume that users have an in-depth knowledge of the transport system. There's real limited user input needed and the digital literacy required to engage with these apps is really low. So while I acknowledge that food and nutrition is a much more complex behaviour, there is a need to learn from this simplicity and we need to look at ways to embed nutrition knowledge and skills but automate this user experience and this is two areas that may help digital technology and nutrition promotion using digital technology deliver to its full potential. Just a final um, aspect in this section of the talk and it's an emerging area that might not have an obvious link to child nutrition and that's the social norms around how we negotiate work-life balance. And this research is important because it has implications both at the policy level in terms of how employees go about supporting, are supported in work-life balance priorities, but also the negotiations and decisions that happen between, within families and between caregivers. So by understanding what's happening sort of more behind closed doors and the negotiations that do or don't occur around domestic responsibilities, this is another area that impacts child as well as caregiver health and wellbeing. 
I don't have any results today as it's an area of current and active research and there's a link on the slide if you want to find out more or participate in this research. So coming back to the um, title of the talk and getting better nutrition onto children's plates and it's going to take a coordinated approach across government, the food supply, a range of settings, caregivers and families. And it will require changing the range of social norms that shape both government as well as individuals' decisions. And I'm going to use the context of the school lunchbox to illustrate this. So in Australia, about 85% of children bring a packed lunch or a lunchbox to school prepared by parents at home. So while the tuck shop or canteen is a common target for school nutrition policy, it's actually the lunchbox that provides you know, 20 to 40% of children's daily food intake. And as illustrated in the media clippings on the slide, not much has changed over subsequent decades. A 2017 study of New South Wales schools estimated that on average children lunchbox contains at least two discretionary choices each day, whilst only 20% um, contained any vegetables. There's also a growing equity issue and we're finding that food relief and welfare agencies are now starting to provide school lunch programs. So it's been common to have school breakfast programs, but now based on the number of children at school with no lunch, these food relief agencies are now moving into providing um, school food to children. And that's not a sustainable or equitable um, um, as avenue. So while school promotion efforts that provide healthy eating guidelines for the canteens, there's another unintended consequence of improving the full food supply in schools and that can be reduced financial viability of school canteens. So all of these things really signal that there needs to be perhaps a thinking outside the lunchbox and a really um, you know, reimagining of how we might want to do school food in Australia. We know that around the world, school food is often delivered quite differently. And an international comparison between Australia and the UK highlight that in particular, the UK school food is associated with higher vegetable intakes for children. So it can make a difference in the particular food groups that we need to shift. So while not without its challenges, can these global examples provide some food for thought here in Australia? And it comes back to some research that um, we conducted a few years ago and really highlighting that more children eating lunch provided by schools would be another avenue for support for parents and caregivers. And we know that many factors influence what items parents provide in children's lunchbox. In this study, we um, engaged over 500 parents and we found that in addition to providing a nutritious diet, parents were considering a really wide range of factors when deciding what foods and drinks to provide. So while our goal as health professionals is nutrition, for parents, they're weighing up compromising, trading off a much broader list. In the next step of this study, we observed that parents making hypothetical lunchbox choices based on these types of um, aspirations or compromises was associated with different nutritional content of the lunchbox. So whether people were prioritising a nutritious diet or showing love and nurturing to their child or... Um, some other goal or, you know, trying to minimise children's resistance, these w did influence what went into the lunchbox. So again, how can we look at um, taking some of that burden and that mental load away um, for, for parents and caregivers and improve children's nutrition along the way? 
This led us to going, okay, well, what could different school food look like in Australia? And through an online um, group brainstorming and consensus process, we brought together the relevant um, stakeholders, so people from education, um, NGOs, parents, the food sector, and to put it out to people um, in the field, those that are working and working with children and families to generate options for a new school food system in Australia. And we were really blown away with this process. It was also through COVID that we were able to open it up to be a national piece of research. And we got much more ideas than we ever hoped for. And what we really discovered through this process is that the idea of reimagining school food in Australia isn't out of the realm of possibility. Through this research, we uncovered a pilot that's about to start in Tasmania, looking at providing um, hot school meals through schools. We um, had someone who's a food service provider already serving hot food in South Australian secondary schools. And we found innovative practices where schools are linking children growing, cooking and eating school food together. And again, not just the lunchbox, but a nutritious, um, you know, complete meal. So these were the ideas, the top ranked priorities that came from this um, brainstorming process. And it really highlights that there's a range of innovative models for school food that people felt could both be very impactful for both nutrition and learning, but also be achievable and feasible. So there was, you know, drawing on some of the international comparisons around school food on site, but also some really out of the box thinking. There was suggestions of a community restaurant that would not only serve the school, but could link different generations together through a shared meal experience. And then there were some other great ideas around businesses that already exist and opportunities for um, ways to expand their business, food trucks at schools or, you know, looking at airline catering services could be another way to look at um, centralised school food. So I think what um, this highlights is there's a really exciting opportunity and that there are some natural experiments already starting up and our aim is to partner with these um, popping up areas of natural experiments and innovative practice and understand the impact on both nutritional um, outcomes but also educational and wider social benefit. Okay, so in summary, there, you know, we are at a time where there's a disconnect between the nutritional science around what will support healthy growth and development in children versus the current dietary patterns that we're seeing. So there is the opportunity for a range of stakeholders to work together. And this can involve, you know, digital supports, but it's really about getting all of the players at the table and singing off the same hymn sheet so that there are those touch points so that no matter where children are eating or learning or playing, they're getting that same protected environment as well as encouraging um, a love and enjoyment of healthy food. I just want to finish by um, acknowledging and thanking my terrific um, research team many of who um, conducted a lot of the research that I was showcasing this evening and just ending with um, thanking the range of funding sources I have and also um, various websites that you can go for further information about some of the research that I spoke about this evening. So thank you, Karen. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, that was actually not just fascinating, but it's far more complex than what one might imagine at the first, at the first hurdle. Um, we are starting to get some questions coming in from the audience, and I would encourage everybody to keep sending your questions. Um, we're really keen for this to be a very interactive discussion, and we've got experts here who can actually 
you know, directly answer your concerns. So uh, don't be shy in coming forward with your questions. Um, I'd like to direct the first question to Themis, um, and, and that's around the role of grandparents and caregivers, which Rebecca touched on just briefly, but how important is their influence in how children then perceive their food choices, and what role do they play in helping to foster healthy diets? It's absolutely huge, to be perfectly honest. I think um, the healthiest populations in the world have uh, evidence to that as well. You know, when you think about the Mediterranean diet, you think about Japanese, arguably the healthiest and longest living populations in the world mm -hmm. with such an incredible food culture that isn't just focused, it's actually focused little on food education, mm -hmm. but focused more on food culture. It's about allowing uh, food to be central to life and really focused on encouraging people to enjoy food together, um, really strong focus on seasonality, a focus on understanding where the food comes from. But it's not really because you should know this, it's because this is just a way of life. It's ingrained in the way that people live there. Um, and it's not really considered then to be anything like a nutrition or a science education session or anything like that. So therefore it's not, I suppose, um, kind of rote learning or, or going to school, it's just literally part of life. So. It's absolutely fundamental and I think, you know, at the end of the day, we know, I think um, Rebecca said, I wrote down so many, so many <laughs> points here, Rebecca, I, was, I loved it. Um, but you said, childhood is when we learn what and how to eat. At the end of the day, food companies know that. Hmm. You know, big food businesses know that exact point and they've been doing it well for a long time, shaping the way people eat in their younger ages to determine what they purchase later in their life as well. Well, we could surely do the same for healthier foods too. And that, that raises a really interesting point about what we're exposed to and what forms our opinions and our desires, things like television advertising versus pressure from, say, your peer group. Um, and then there's the cultural factor, what sort of family background you have. Um, how important is it for parents uh, as principal caregivers and, and perhaps schools as secondary caregivers to be curating the kind of messages that children get? Or is it more about... Um, giving the children the resilience to make the right choices rather than trying to shield them from it, which might be an impossible task. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's about the caregivers being role models. It's about the caregivers uh, leading by example. At the end of the day, children look up to their parents, to their older siblings. Um, they want to be like those people more than anyone in the world. And um, having positive role models is fundamental. Um, but at the same time, you know, explaining, I suppose, providing a, a range of foods, you know, a range of different colours and textures and flavour mm. profiles is fundamental. It's not that anything is better or worse in terms of flavour, it's just that something's different. But if you're constantly exposed to the same flavour profile, when you try anything that's different to that, it's worse. But it's not, it's just different. And if you expose people's palates to a range of foods from a younger age, when they try new things, they aren't, I suppose, as shocked by them when they do eventually mm. taste them. It's interesting, we've got a question here from Jess who says, what approach do you suggest for parents of fussy eaters. Now, isn't that a classic? We always hear those children who just don't want to eat anything. You know, if it's green, I'm not going to touch it. You know, they've got their set views. Um, and, this, and Jess says, quite rightly, I just want to get some food into my kids. Some thoughts from the panel. I mean, I think that last statement is incredibly telling. I just want to get food into my kids. And yes, we don't want um, children not thriving and we do want them to get the nutrition that they need. But we can take the pressure off ourselves as caregivers a bit and see this as a marathon, not a sprint. And, um, you know, that's the philosophy that we're taking through VegKit. It's not about um, either force feeding children or saying eat your carrots because they'll make your you'll see better in the dark that I think we were all told that as kids but it's about highlighting different ways to engage and interact with food and in, the, in this case vegetables so just we we've done some research and even just having it on the plate or even picture books picture books that have vegetables and um, talk about the different properties of vegetables and being brave enough to try new foods in itself can um, help influence what children are eating. So it doesn't have to be, the goal doesn't have to be getting my child to eat. It could be smelling it, touching it, talking about where it comes from, 
um, a whole range of experiences that in the long term will um, you know, shift those things because it is a, it's a phase of child development, that sort of fear of new food. It, when we were hunter of gatherers, it protected us, it made sure we were safe. In today's world, we don't need it so much, but we've still got that lasting sort of hesitancy. And for some children, it can be more pronounced. But I think the main thing is it's a marathon, not a sprint. What about engaging children in the food development process, whether it's, you know, selecting at the supermarket what we're going to buy this week or getting involved in the cooking or the preparation? I mean, does that have an, an effect? Absolutely. Mm. I think, um, again, there's a sense of ownership. There's a sense of I was involved in this. Um, I want to see it through to the end as well. But I think also um, there's a lot of psychology involved in this too and appreciating that at the end of the day... Um, you know, timing is really important as well. Don't try to introduce a new food to a child when they're cranky or when they're sleepy. At the end of the day as well, our primal urge for hunger will generally always win. And if you provide the food to the child when they're hungry, a new food to a child when they're hungry, they're most likely going to try it then and pos probably have a positive experience as well. And try to partner something that is familiar with a less familiar food so that it's less kind of confronting as well. Just kind of think about it as an adult. If you walk into a room to do something you've never done before with a bunch of people you've never met before, whatever it might be, it can be a confronting situation. A child will also develop those nerves and you know, their initial response is to kind of withdraw as well. So um, understand the psychology behind the situation mm. as well. Mm. And coming back to food culture, you know, again, you sometimes have Italian menus where the salad is by itself and at the start of the meal. So again, we can use different strategies, either you know, if children don't want it all mixed up together, but even having them involved in preparing meals and they might just crunch on veggies while you're cooking and they might prefer it raw rather than cooked. Doesn't make any difference in terms of the nutrition or the experience that they're having. Um, so try try anything. It leads to another really um, very pertinent question uh, from a member of the audience here. How can we better educate ourselves as parents about discretionary foods, portion sizes and requirements, and the fruit and veg intake for our children? So that that uh, knowingness. How how do parents actually discover the the right um, approach the right methods, the right amounts, um, the right kinds of food, because they're being bombarded as much as children are, aren't they, with, with all these other suggestions? Mm -hmm. Which is why I started my talk with the stats I did and the context, because, um, you know, when I'm interacting with people, if I just say, oh, did you know one serve of discretionary foods is six chips? They're like, what? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the portion size that we get sold at the fish and chip shops or the chicken and chip shops is is so at the other end of the spectrum compared never to that. We would never put three six, chips. Yeah, what? six <laughs> chips on a plate. The yeah, and so you know, I yeah. I, I really stick about that. Yeah. And but I think it's about um, also moderation and the eighty twenty rule, and mm. really choosing. You know, I think places like childcare and schools, we do need to think of them as protected environments. You know, that's where. Um, healthy food should be the norm and then we can enjoy um, with moderation and enjoyment birthday cakes or, or things but I think the other thing is just being mindful of how quickly treats can you know mm. an ice cream here or a lolly here a packet of chips there I think. Are there good resources that parents can turn to I mean is it as simple as going to say the CSIRO website or or are there other resources or are these apps actually filling that gap where parents can get you know, valid information quickly that will help inform the choices they're making. Yeah, I, I think to be honest, I think the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating is a, you know, you referenced it in your in your talk, and at the end of the day, it's a pretty easily attainable resource that does provide some pretty good examples of portion sizes and explains what discretionary foods are. I think it's a it's a resource that comes under, I suppose, attack semi frequently, um, and I think somewhat unwarranted because the truth is most people literally don't actually meet the recommendations but they want to change something they don't they literally don't meet so um, it's got such a strong focus on vegetables and fruits and and whole grains and healthy health promoting foods but it does provide um, some recommendations in terms of portion sizes as well 
We've got a really interesting question here. In fact, we've got two, and I'm going to sort of bolt them together because they're, they're kind of related. Uh, the first is wondering about the place of policy frameworks regarding school canteen food. But that's followed by, um, by Astrid, who says, this is a really interesting talk. Did your research on food provisioning mention anything on the nature of the workforce? as most school canteens rely heavily on volunteers. It's a great point. Would changing this system be needed in order to improve food provision? Your thoughts on the school canteen, policies, staffing, how important is that? I have some strong thoughts on that, to be perfectly honest. I think that's an incredibly important question. I think at the end of the day, um, uh, when we speak to adults about improving their nutrition uh, and their dietary intake, if I speak to someone who works from home versus someone who works in an office versus someone who works in the CBD, or someone who's a truck driver and doesn't have a refrigerator or whatever all day long, um, they talk to me about the barriers and the logistical issues they have in terms of eating healthy food. Why is it different for a child going to school that doesn't have a fridge and that you know, does have a, just a locker or whatever it might be at school? We, every child has a, well most children have access to computers and a lot of them now have a laptop they take to school every day. Why has technology and all these other aspects of our education system progressed so far that the school canteen has literally not progressed an inch in so many ways? And at the end of the day, um, we have to look at the logistical issues that, that meet children eating a balanced diet at school. And that doesn't just come down to the school, I suppose, that does not just come down to the, where they store their food, but it also comes down to the level of investment that's put into school canteens, the policies, which without, within my question, absolutely need to be reviewed because they are simply too long and too difficult to, for most people who work there to understand and review frequently, as well as the um, equipment and the training of the people working within those organisations with regards to nutrition, simple cooking ability, as well as even dietary requirement management, which is a major consideration within schools too. Mm. And I think that's why we were engaging, you know, not coming up with a solution, but actually starting with the people with the knowledge and skills, you know, um, catering companies, for example, or, you know, we provide meals in aged care, in airline situations, in childcare. Um, so it can be done. There are the logistics, but I think the workforce is really important. And, you know, again, as we have changing in, um, you know, particularly female participation in the workforce and perhaps we're losing our volunteer army, that support canteens, that could be another reason why we really need to re-look at this and, and do some investment also in setting up a financially viable structure that could also support a skilled and knowledgeable workforce. Um, there's also areas of innovation. So again, through VegKit, what we're doing is having a look at um, putting the nutrition behind the scenes, so coming up with a menu that meets the, the guidelines, but then um, working with um, different distributors to get a menu box. So like HelloFresh at home, we could do menu boxes for different sectors. So it takes a bit of the need for, you know, in-depth nutrition knowledge and just says, here, here's all the ingredients you need um, to, to meet those recommendations. So that's another innovative way of getting that um, shift in what's provided in line with recommendations without necessarily having to train individual cooks or chefs all the time. Mm. Look, it leads to another question we've received here and it, it, it makes a very good point. It leads with, the school battle is hard. Yeah, I think everyone's going to agree with that. My kids see their friends with a lunch order of a donut and a pie, then refuse to eat the fruit that I send them. Now, if I could send them with rice and other reheatable foods, they would embrace this. So is there something about the accessibility of facilities for children so that they can actually own their food choices effectively? Yeah, without a doubt, that's exactly the logistics I was kind of referring to. I, as an adult, don't want to take a sandwich to work every single day. Um, I, I just don't do it. Um, but so to be honest, what, what I have access to in terms of preparing my food impacts what I eat. And it's exactly the same for a child. The difference is the child isn't going to make a health conscious decision either because they aren't thinking like that at, at a younger age. Um, it also highlights the importance of positive peer pressure. It relates exactly to what you were talking about, Rebecca, about the importance of those protected meal times. And if we can protect that meal time, 
the flow on effect will be that we introduce children that they might not get exposure to, uh, to foods that they don't get exposure to at home. And then the flow on from that is a positive peer pressure that might occur from seeing other people actually eating the foods that they should be eating. Mm. There's a question here from <coughs> Alice, um asking, what tips would you have for kids who pack their own lunch? Where do they start? I mean, are they relying on what mum and dad are putting in the fridge for them or the pantry for them to choose from? Or, you know, how much influence do they have? And, and what tips should they be considering when they think about what they're going to be putting in their lunchbox for the day? Mm. Mm. Hopefully they can start by packing it together. Yep. I think that's a really important step to get a bit of guidance to begin with. So a bit of positive influence from, again, an older sibling or a, a, a parent. Um, basically, start. I, I like to keep it simple. Think about food groups. Right? Just think, at the end of the day, the key to nutrition is about variety. Okay? It's about making sure you're ticking all of your nutrient needs. An apple is a healthy food, but it can't meet all of your nutrient needs, no matter how many apples you eat. So the key is to have a wide, varied diet. So think about where your whole grains are, think about where a little bit of dairy is, your fruits, your veggies, um, and just make sure you're ticking all those boxes, and I think that's a really key way to start planning any meal, but especially a lunchbox. But do well. kids think like that in terms of packing their own lunchbox? Well, probably not, but that's, um, I think that's a good point. I think that's where the guidance needs to come from the parent or the older person to begin with, and it possibly also maybe is maybe a little uh, a checklist, a little practical checklist. Have I got this in my, in my lunchbox? Am I ready to go, basically, for the day? But they don't. Um, but I think that's, again, positive peer pressure, and positive influence from other people around them. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Okay. I mean, it, it's sort of the same as um, generic approaches to parenting in the same mm -hmm. way that we'd, with older kids, set up some rules around when they can um, be home safely by themselves. You'd start by, you know, talking about it, setting up some shared rules together. Mm -hmm. You'd then give it a chance on a small trip and, and work up slowly. And I think that's the same with any area of parenting and it relates to what you can apply to food and nutrition as well. I think, you know, children do like to have some control and they like to have some independence. So I think getting them involved earlier in those, you know, just setting up, well, and the nice thing about today's lunch boxes is they've got lots of little sections so you can actually play to that and say, well, you know, what's going to be in here in terms of fruit, veg, dairy, um, and the sort of main protein and breads and cereals component. So, yeah. so we've got another question here from Steph this time. How do we get better nutrition onto kids' plates while working within a budget? And when it comes down to the dollar, I mean, that can have a big influence, can't it, on, on, the, on the weekly shop, for example, and, and how you um, consider your meal structures. So how, how can that be done effectively, do you think? Yeah, so the, um, you know, that's part of the role of the digital technology and the meal planning because mm -hmm. I guess if you think about over the course of the week, you can also um, play to things that are on special, play to the things that are in season and then make sure that that ingredient appears in a couple of things. And I think the other thing is not too many ingredients and that was another key area that was limited in the apps is they were sort of more fancy recipes and and took a lot of ingredients so I think the other thing is you know these books or websites um, where there's sort of five ingredients um, is another way that you can do that on on a budget yeah planning yeah. is really important you know um, making sure that you're not wasting money on other things or going back to the shop multiple times in the week you're reusing ingredients, you're getting the most out of ingredients, using the odd ends of carrots and onions to make your own stocks, um, try not to waste anything is really important too. We've got a follow-up question um, <coughs> in relation to the prevalence of food allergies and the effect that that has in how you construct um, you know, dietary choices for children. Um, you know, how do you get a balanced diet into kids who have got gluten intolerances or dairy um, allergies, for example? Um, some special challenges there. Um, do parents need to, uh, to think more carefully in those circumstances? Well, clearly they do, but how do we do it effectively so that things are still appealing and tasty? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's having an impact not only for the children with the allergies, but say in school and childcare, it does influence um, what other children are having depending on the policy of the school. And, you know, it could be one of the reasons why there's more crackers and um, chips in the lunchbox because, you know, healthy foods such as nuts 
you know, most schools have sort of a not free policy. So I think it is an area that um, does limit both, um, you know, the whole the whole sector. Um, I mean, I think the around allergies, it's really about getting um, professional support and looking at those areas where there are whole food groups limited and, and getting, you know, accredited practising dietitian and, and other sources of information to get that specialist advice. Yeah, I think yeah. it's important to understand what you can't have. Identify the food. If it's an allergy, it's generally going to be one or a couple of foods that you can't have. If it's an intolerance, it's going to be potentially a range of foods that you have to limit, not completely avoid, and understand the difference between an allergy and an intolerance is a really important consideration because intolerance, you might be unnecessarily completely uh, eliminating a food group. But then understand, kind of say, this is the food that I can or the food group that I need to limit, and these are some appropriate substitutes as well. So really just have a list of can't and then potential substitutes that meet the nutrient needs of the food you're removing and basically purchase from that list. Mm. And, you know, there might be websites, but that's also where specialist advice and getting that initial Absolutely. list up and going and then making your choices from there. We've got a question from our very own Robin Clark, actually, who happens to be a professor also at the Caring Futures Institute. And she is, is curious to know how the COVID lockdown has affected children's diets. Has it had a dramatic impact? I don't know. I mean, there's the research that we're doing, we're focusing more on... Um, caregiver behaviour, so we're, we're doing sort of a use of time diary to measure their activity patterns and we're um, getting them to do a detailed record of what they eat. So we'll know for caregivers, um, but we haven't got that information for children. So a really good question. I don't know if yeah. you're across anything. It's a great question. Yeah. I would say in some way it's been affected, but hopefully in a positive way, because I think more than ever, we've seen people connect with community, connect with family and connect with food again um, by cooking more in the kitchen. So hopefully um, maybe there's been a, a, maybe a slight positive shift mm. to, towards food. But I guess given the role modelling and that what parents eat does make similar to what children eat, we will be able to have a look at that based on what differences we're seeing in what um, parents and caregivers are eating. So a question in relation to the role of artificial intelligence, um, the fridges that choose the meals and, and what's going to be in the fridge, uh, is there um, an avenue there in terms of the development of technology to help influence healthier food choices and, and more balanced diets, particularly at young ages? I think, you know, there's endless possibilities. We shouldn't never say never. I think certainly um, text rec recognition and artificial intelligence, you know, because we make so many food decisions and because there's so many recipes and food choices, it's not as simple as the transport um, situation I give. So we are really going to need to use innovative technology to try and simulate all of those decisions that people are making and break down the complex information, so, yeah. I think the only potential issue, and I know virtually nothing about artificial intelligence and technology, I should just say that before I say my comment, but I think the, the only issue I see with AI is the fact that it's basically built on algorithms and it's built on, I, I think what we might see is a lack of variety within people's diets, mm. because it's built on trends of what you've already previously eaten. It doesn't have the ability to think outside of the previous behaviour. So it ends up replicating old behaviour more than anything and you'll end up learning more about potential recipes that are potentially things you might like as opposed to things that you should be trying. Hmm. Jane asks, can you tell us about the research you did with kitchen gardens and schools growing and cooking food, especially in low socioeconomic areas? How did that pan out? Oh, we didn't... Um we haven't done any. You haven't? No, but no. I guess the, the example that we identified is, I think it was um, a mainly, it was a high school and an agricultural focus school where they had a very strong focus on both the curriculum of growing food and cooking, so then linking to health, you know, home economics, and then using what children are doing through the curriculum to then eat the food. So um, that was the example that I was referring to there. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, I think we will leave the last question of the night to an eight-year-old. 
Fantastic. <laughs> and they haven't given their name, but they've written, I'm eight years old, and I want to know if I'm able to bring one junk food a day. Over to our experts. One junk food a day? My response to that is possibly. <laughs> um, I think when I talk about discretionary foods, what I like to say to most people is you're able to have them, just make sure that you're not having them in place of other healthy foods, okay? Because if you're kicking, if you're substituting um, a, 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 a junk food, as it's referred to, for something else like vegetables or a main meal or breakfast, it's having a significantly negative effect on your diet compared to if you're having it in conjunction with other healthy foods. And it also means that you're not gonna necessarily be eating it when you're starving. I'd rather you go for a healthier snack or a healthy meal when you're hungry and then maybe have a little, as people refer to them, a treat to kind of top it off rather than it being the sole, sole food you're consuming. Mm. And I guess I'd put out the challenge to all eight-year-olds and all children to see what could come from being food adventurers. And I think if we could, you know, have a look at, um, you know, trying 10 new foods between now and the end of the year and seeing whether there's some foods that then you like as much as the one treat that you'd like to put in the lunchbox, then I think that would be a really good outcome as well. So in wrapping up, and um, I'm going to ask this, there's no pun intended, but if you had a takeaway message from tonight's forum um, for both uh, yourself, Beck, and Themis, uh, what would your take-home message be from tonight's forum? Let me go Here first. Go. Um, I think that we've touched on it a little bit. I think role modelling is incredibly important. I think the food environment that we eat in, that we teach our children to eat in, is absolutely crucial. And trying to create a positive food culture is fundamental, not just for today, but for the next 20, 30 years. Um, and I would encourage people to introduce foods in so many different ways. Just because a child doesn't like a food in a particular way doesn't mean they're not going to like it another way, on another day, um, and perhaps in another setting cooked by a different person. So constantly introduce foods in as many different ways and try to create a positive food culture as much as you can. Yeah. And I guess my take home is really just because we've done things in a particular way before doesn't mean we have to do that um, in terms of the way we approach nutrition promotion. And let's try to really expand our thinking and learn from different sectors and different industries to see whether there's things that we can achieve our goals around healthy children's nutrition, growth and development, but perhaps in ways that we haven't um, quite seen relevant or applicable um, yet. And do you mean like the, the yeah. restaurant type yeah. idea inside a school, for example? Yeah, um, all of those sort of um, ways that we can look what's working in other sectors, whether it be childcare or aged care or airline catering, what could we learn um, to apply that to schools and other settings where children spend their time? It's commercialising almost yeah. the, the, the notion of the healthy eating. Yeah, yeah. And, and applying that, how soon? I mean, are we talking even kindergarten level or are we only talking sort of primary school level or, or secondary? I mean, where do, where do we actually start to introduce these choices? I mean, the great thing is we've already got a platform. We're already doing this in childcare, which is where children are spending an increasing amount of their time. I think it's just bridging that so that they keep having that journey of the kitchen facilities or the, the fridge um, facilities and the, the workforce there, um, you know, it's, it's in the realm of possibility of the next couple of years. Like we said, we're already seeing some pilots happening um, in different places around, around Australia. So it sounds like in a nutshell, we, we've got some great ideas that are coming through. The research is supporting better decisions. Um, if we can tap into the quality that's available out there and ensure that we're making clever choices, it's possible to do it within a budget. And we've got great technology which could support us to be making better decisions. 
Fantastic. That sounds pretty yeah. good. Hey, look, I would like to um, thank you both as panellists for um, contributing this evening. Um, we have reached um, the end of our session and I'd also like to thank the audience for your questions and for engaging with us in this topic which has really, um, I think, illuminated some of the options that we've got available. Um, we know that dietary uh, impacts on children are absolutely fundamental because what happens in childhood can have lasting ramifications throughout a person person's entire life. It's, uh, it's wrapped up in their education, in their health outcomes, even in their employment prospects if, if, if their lives take the wrong turn through something as simple as how they eat as children. So um, thank you for your salient questions and for participating in tonight's online forum. Um, I would like to say thank you once more to Rebecca and Themis for your knowledge and your expertise in this. And um, I would like to also remind our audience that you can revisit tonight's session on online through our Flinders website. Um, you can go to uh, flinders.edu.au, our YouTube channel, or our Flinders Brave webpage. You can also register there for future events. So thank you once again, everybody, and good night.